Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Monday night installment of CU at USC. My name is Dan Toomey, and joining me tonight is architect Chris Mercier, head of FER Studios here in Southern California. It's going to be an interview you do not want to miss. Stick with us. And thank you for joining us once again. My name is Dan Toomey here for CU at USC. And once again joining us, Mr. Chris Mercier. Chris, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. And now just right off the bat, um, a little bit of biographical information for the folks at home who might not be aware of, of who you are and what you do in the architecture world. Just uh, let's start from the beginning. How did you first get involved with architecture? Uh, I was interested in the artist. I was interested in being an artist actually back in high school. Really? And uh, I spent some time doing that. And then I realized near the end of high school trying to make that college decision as mm. to what you guys yeah. are doing. <laughs> It's what I was going to do, and I came up with this idea that, you know, if you become an artist, you can't do architecture, but if you become an architect, you can still do art. You can do art, yeah. Right. And so that was kind of a premise to how I kind of started, got things rolling. Hmm. And uh, from there, I went into architecture school, and I ended up in Italy for a year, and then into basically mm -hmm. Los Angeles, and I've kind of been here ever since. Yeah, and so now now you're here. Um, you're, you began FER Studios in 2002. Um, mm -hmm. Would you mind just describing, uh, FER takes a bit of a, a different direction towards architecture than, than, and, than other, uh, I guess, regular architecture studios. Would you mind just elaborating upon that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. FER stands for Form Environment Research, basically, and uh, part of it comes out of uh, a little bit of what I did before. I mean, I worked for Frank Airy's office for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I have 10 years of this kind of really hands-on modeling kind of experience. And yeah. so what we do is we spend a lot of time modeling the process in, three, in the computer, in a lot of different physical models, as a way of understanding the spaces. And so that becomes a way of really letting the project inform itself mm -hmm. as you develop these things. And so as you go through this thing, you realize that the, the, a project sometimes isn't in a drawing or isn't in a model, but it actually exists somewhere between these things. Hmm. And you're trying to capture that moment when you actually kind of lock it into what it's going to be. Yeah, and a lot of your works center around more um, modern style architecture. Mm -hmm. where, did, where did you first um, become inspired by that, that form of architecture? Was it a specific architect or was it really just your own, um, your own inspiration? No, I mean, I think, I, I, I think it's more, how do you put it this way? It, it doesn't, for me, at least personally, it, it doesn't make sense to go make 19th century kind of buildings or mm. buildings that represent that because to me it doesn't represent the culture that we experience every day. And, yeah. and it's like, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't write a 1900-year-old 19 melody. Yeah. You write it, if you do, you write it with a way that has a modern kind of understanding because that's how we live. And so mm. I want to make buildings that have, that are more in relationship to what we feel as today's experience. Yeah. That aren't nostalgic necessarily. Definitely. Now, uh, in, in, as we're on the conversation of inspiration, are there any particular architects that you that you would say like, oh, this is definitely my biggest inspiration? Or I wouldn't say there's one in particular, but mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, Morphous is doing some great things. Mm -hmm. They always have Tom Main there. Uh, Frank Gehry's work has been great. Yeah. Corbusier is, is a, a, um, another one. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's Tirani from uh, Italy. There's there's a lot of kind of inspirations, I think it come from different areas and for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. looking at uh, FER Studios um, in particular, what is it like, it's been running since 2002, so it's, it's not yeah. new to the business. It no. has its, no. it has its no. feet uh, solidified. What would you say, how, what's it like um, working with, is a group of, of about 20 of you, am I, am I correct? There's correct? about 12 to 15. 12 to 15, so, yeah, yeah. and have they been with there since, since the beginning of the program? It, it's or? changed its fluctuations. When I started off, I was really about two people, myself and one other person, then really? another person. And then we, the office grew and, and expanded, and we started off in a small space, and you know, as you kind of grow, you keep getting bigger mm -hmm. things. And so now we're anywhere between 12 and 15, pending on the project. Really? And so we've got a number of different things going on. And so as projects expand, we, the office has to expand to kind of meet those kind of conditions. Okay, and, and so when, when you say pending on the project, does that mean like there will be a certain amount of people in the studio working on it at this time, or like everybody in the studio will always be working on the same project? Well, no, we, there's, there's, it, we were just talking when I, we came in, so there's probably about 15 projects going on in the office right now. Really? And so everything from the scale of 
small house condition too. Like we've got an urban design thing that's uh, like 100,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what's happening. And, yeah. and some of the people are working, there may be one or two people on the house, there may be six people on this other project. And depending on how deadlines work, you shifting people in the office mm. on different projects to meet the deadlines that are happening. So everybody in the office in some ways gets to work on a variety of projects. Yeah. You're not just stuck on one, but you usually have one project that you kind of call home, if you will. And you're, yeah. you're focused yeah. on that one, but so you're having to jump. Everybody's kind of involved in that, but there's exactly. other side But they have projects. to jump to help because we have to kind of team up to get the thing done. Mm -hmm. And I think it's better for the office that way. It helps to keep, really. you're not always doing the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. Same project. And it definitely keeps keeps everybody stimulated and working hard. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 we talk about how there's there's so many projects going on at the same time. You guys have worked on private residencies, you've yeah. worked on restaurants, you've worked on on bars or hotels. Mm -hmm. Where do you first um, get the idea for a project? Do people because it's the, it's so many different types of buildings, and is is that common for an architecture studio? Or? Well, uh, some architecture studios focus on particular kind of types, if you will. Like some people just do restaurants or whatever. But, I, but I've never had that position or that that mm, interest. I think it's better off that you do a variety of things because when you're generating ideas, you're definitely generating it from a number of things. One is mm -hmm. from the client their needs, their desires, kind of yeah. what they're really after. Another thing becomes your site conditions, your surrounding, your context of where mm -hmm. the building is going to go. And then the next thing becomes is that I think it's important that you, sometimes what you do in a house is something you want to bring to an urban design. There may be an idea that mm. gets expanded or something you do in a restaurant that you want to bring into a kitchen of a house. Yeah. So yeah, it, it helps to kind of play those overlaps, which I think mm -hmm. is more interesting than to always doing one building type. Yeah. And, and do you think, um, how, how often do you feel like you're drawing inspirations from different types of buildings and putting them into All the time. I mean, really? That's, well, it's more fun than doing the same. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. To me, it's like you're always dragging from other things. And yeah. you're dragging from fashion, and you're dragging from the art world, and you're dragging really? from sculpture, mm -hmm. and you're dragging from anything. I mean, freeway bridges. I mean, mm -hmm. whatever you see may be something that triggers an idea or an, an inspiration. That's funny. So... Uh, I guess basing off of that, describe your artistic process a little bit. I mean, it could be from, from your own personal art or architecture. Where do you usually start with a project? Well, I mean, from a typical architecture project will always start based on the client and the site and those conditions. But hmm. there may be extraneous things that come in. Like I'm, I'm always, as, a, as an artist, I'm also working on a series of paintings and things like that that I'm doing on my own mm -hmm. outside of the office. And so those paintings are have a lot to do with what I think about architectural space really? and how you project and deal with space. And so I may take ideas that are developing in those paintings and they just by accident or by, just by default, they get into the design of the building in a lot of times mm -hmm. and, and vice versa. What we're doing That's a lot of times in models that actually comes in out in the painting and it becomes a way of exploring things. I mean, I think I, and I always felt that there isn't a difference, any difference between sculpture, architecture and painting. I mean, in one sense, what you're dealing with every single time is space and how you hmm. understand and form and shape and get people to react to space. Yeah. Now, be it a portrait, be it a sculpture, be it anything, you're ultimately, when you create a portrait, even to somebody, you're always placing that in some type of space. And that reading of that portrait has something to do with the space that it's in. Mm -hmm. Sculpture, you obviously move around or move through, and the same with buildings. Yeah. And so, so would you say, are you more inspired by seeing the space first or... or or seeing a space and then looking at other forms of art to draw your inspiration from. I, th I think it's, it, to me, it's like, it, what's interesting is figuring out what that space is or what, to me, that's what, I, it's kind of what the design and art and all the things are about mm -hmm. is, is trying to figure out what is the right space to do something hmm. in. Yeah, yeah. Right, because it, there's a lot of assumptions. We have, we have to make assumptions all day. This is how you do this. Mm -hmm. This is how you make a photo studio or a yeah. studio, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, so there's exactly. an assumption on how to do it. But then you test and you test and challenge those ideas and you want to say, is that still the right way mm -hmm. to make a studio with today's technology and with, with today's opportunities? Yeah. And um, if you could, are there any specific projects that, that come to mind in the past few years where you're saying, like, this is really how we push the boundaries of, of architecture in any way when dealing with space? Um, you know, we've, there's, we, we did a project, kind of a theoretical thing for the city of Inglewood, where we, we tried to, the city of Inglewood has a new light rail coming in. It's actually under construction right now. Really? And then, and it's going to drop, in a, the station's going to be right near the downtown area, which is really a fabulous thing, and it goes on the way to LAX Airport. So we developed a downtown new plan for that whole area. Mm -hmm. It was a very large project on a number of different sites, and, uh, and in that thing we were trying to re-establish the idea of what public space, how you treat and how you use public space. And I'll, I'll 
make a reference in the sense that yeah. a lot of today's today what happens is that you drive around and you go to you go to here you go there and you park in this lot or you cross this plaza and stuff and a lot of times what happens is that those are actually private space that really? is allowing you like if you go downtown and you cross a plaza yeah. to go to another building that's generally not, you're on private public? property and that private property at some point could be taken away so we were oh, trying to develop a project okay. where you said how do you create how does the city own the property or the main portions of the property and the buildings that have become privately owned interlink with that hmm. so that the public space is truly public space yeah and then how does that feed ideas where how do you how do you program it so that things like we are we kept saying is how do you have how, how can you program in a sense that we we called it um we were trying to intermingle spaces in the sense that if you did a elderly person's home yeah is there a way to link that with a daycare center for kids so that yeah, you're taking yeah, yeah. a program two programs that in some ways they seem far apart but in, in terms of function they could totally it, but, they, but, they, yeah, but the kids could inspire exactly the elder and there can be this great thing and so we we're trying to mix program with that public space idea that's funny so and so it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a spatial kind of physical thing it was about program it was mm -hmm. about use and yeah. a bunch of things and I was, I was gonna say that's interesting because personally whenever I've thought architecture I always think of like the structure of a building but I guess yeah. you never really is that something they stress is more is focusing also on the function of the building itself and its placement in regards to everything else well yeah I mean you have to sometimes you have to ask those questions a lot of times you're really? given a program and you're given a, thi a, a building for area and, mm -hmm. and, and the, you know the client says here this is what I want and you as the architect sometimes you need to come with the ideas well yeah, that's that's kind of the obvious approach, but maybe if you stretched it, you can you can do something else with it, and you can find another way mm -hmm. that you can enhance the program you have mm -hmm. and get it to work with what's across the street, what's mm -hmm. down the way, and you're basically dealing with the urban fabric. You're starting to tie into what's in an urban condition that stretches across the city. Mm -hmm. And do do you have any preference in terms of working with a specific type of space? Is there anyone that you're saying like, oh, this like uh, I work in a private uh, like a private residency? That's my ideal space to work with or do you feel like you you prefer it to be flexible no I, and I I like to work with all different clients and all different things yeah. and I think it's that again it's that jumping around from doing private residences from doing restaurants from doing urban design by doing those mixtures you it allows you to kind of think things differently mm -hmm. and like how do you create more of an urban space in your in your outdoor of your house that's more like an urban space that yeah. might be in a piazza or a plaza yeah. and how do you kind of make those kind of crossovers and especially um, when considering the eco-friendly aspect to, yeah. to, to the whole FER studio uh, idea is that is that do you ever find that that's hard to incorporate sometimes yeah, you know it, it's I always feel like it I mean the whole notion of sustainability that's happened for all these years and all these things I think a lot of that really is is a lot more traditional than people want to really? kind of say I mean the way Why is the that? Way, well just the orientation of solar orientation is really really a, a an age old, thousands that, of year yeah, old that, thing. That's true. Dealing with winds, that's yeah. thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. A lot of the ideas, the, the basics of what sustainable design is, comes from that. It's just that in the in the last, I'm going to say, 20 years, the focus has kind of shifted a little bit and become a lot about the technology of sustainability, and that always just about. There's a lot simpler things to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a great quote. Uh, I can't remember what it came from. Someone said, I thought this was a fabulous thing. He, someone said. They were talking, it was a, a talk about something. He said, the most sustainable building isn't necessarily the one with the most sustainable products. It's actually the building that the community thinks is the best. Because if the community likes the building, they're going to sustain it, no exactly. matter what. And so if you make a, the really great building, that's probably the most sustainable building. And that's some great advice to any architects yeah. who might be watching. And it might entice them to watch the second half of this episode. We have to go to a commercial break real quick. But once again, thank you for being thank here. You. Do not miss the second half. We'll be right back.
The year was 1938, and the U.S. sat on the brink of another world war. The American people looked for diversion from the trials and tribulations of a new century and its new problems. In 1940, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt authorized the release of an entirely new form of entertainment. Today, a hope of many years standing is in large part fulfilled. It was called the Trojan Visual and Auditory Mimeograph Device, or Trojan Vision for short. As bombs fell and war was waged, society tuned to 8.1 for relief. Throughout American history, Trojan Vision has shown us the moments of America's triumphs, spreading the finest programming throughout Greater Los Angeles and worldwide online. Watch Trojan Vision and see history being made. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to tonight's Monday night episode of See You at USC. My name is Dan Toomey, and once again joining me, architect Chris Mercier. Chris, Thanks. once again, thank you for being here. Um, and in the first half, we talked a lot about the, the different types of projects you work on and, and your work at FER Studios specifically. Something I think would be interesting for people who have absolute, such as myself, who know pretty much nothing about architecture, um, how do you first, when you, when you enter a space, what are the first things that you see when you, when you come into it? How do you first approach a project? Um, you mean if like a building in, out in the environment when you walk yeah, up and see yeah. what you look at? Uh, again, I always start with, I need to get inspired. I want to, I'm looking for something that, in terms of the scale, how the building changes scale and how it addresses scale in mm -hmm. terms of use. And so does it direct you kind of, does it tell you kind of where to go? Am I, is it obvious to really? me, like where's the entrance? Mm -hmm. And, and, and sometimes it should be, and sometimes it maybe not want to really, be. Really, yeah. Right? So, so it doesn't so, always show you where you need to be. Yeah, and, and some buildings want to do that. Like most public buildings want to tell you where to go. Mm -hmm. That's kind of things. But other private buildings, sometimes maybe they wants to be a little bit more secretive about what you need to do and where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're looking for cues in terms of how the language of the architecture talks to you. And mm -hmm. it talks to everybody, but sometimes we don't realize we're reading it. Really? Yeah. And w do you prefer that? I mean, would you prefer a building to sort of, you walk in there, you say, okay, like I, like it's it's telling me where I need to go, or do you ever prefer walking in and saying, this is I can more I can work with this, I can kind of make my own out of this. And I'm sure we're asking on that one. Like, do you do you ever enjoy facing the challenge of saying I oh, really yeah. don't know? Is that like do you no, look forward to when that? When we designed the building, I definitely we we definitely questioned about what what it is what what. Assume you would be the obvious entrance, and then where would you really want to go with the entrance? Um, hmm. There's there's different ways to approach it. I'm trying to think of one of the projects. Uh, even like the one, so even for a resident sometimes, there can be a main street entrance that sometimes obviously where you would put the entrance. Sometimes we don't put it there to create more of a privacy for the, the client mm. wants a more private condition. That entrance is maybe tucked off to the side a little bit so that yeah. it's not so obviously right out front. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a house in Santa Monica where we did, where you don't, when you come, you actually come in on the side into the residence, mm -hmm. it's still on the front portion of the house, but it is entered on the side a little bit, so huh. it's not at the very front. And that creates front. privacy. It, well, it, it starts to sell somebody when they're at the front front of the house, oh, I got to walk around and go over there. Mm -hmm. And so it suggests a delay, hmm. and that delay in your, kind of your process tells yeah. you a little bit about, oh, this is not, maybe not open to everybody. That's so cool. Yeah, and, so. And, and, is, and is that based a lot off of what the, what the customer wants, or... Like, do they ever give you when a customer? What what do you usually get when a customer approaches you? I guess is a better question. You generally get a, a program, meaning a list of uses, and they have square footages tied to them. Mm -hmm. You get a site where where this is going to go, and then you get some kind of idea of what a budget is and a timeline. And so huh. those are the kind of things you're given. And then mm -hmm. you you develop a schedule based on those things of what you need to do when to make these thing kind of thing come together. Mm -hmm. And then you start a process where you actually start designing the thing. Usually we start with just getting the, we usually we build a model of the basic con site conditions. So we build a model yeah. of the site, any of the surrounding buildings. So we start to understand what is the context. Mm -hmm. And then we start playing with blocks. So you'll take each piece of the program. If a living room, let's, a house is a simple way to talk about it. Living sure. room, kitchen, bathrooms, bedrooms, and you make blocks mm -hmm. for each one of the things to scale. Okay. And so you build the whole thing in a bunch of pieces of blocks. Mm -hmm. And then it's like when we were kids, you play with those blocks yeah. to start to understand how might this thing come together? Mm -hmm. Is it a two story? Is it a one story? Is it three story? How do those things meet? Yeah. Does there need to be integrated outdoor space? And that kind of yeah. stuff. So you play with that. And then that, through that process, it starts to evolve. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how does it evolve after the design process? Do you find 
after you come up with a final design and then you actually go to the space and, tr and try to construct it, has it ever shifted in a way? Like, we, oh, we need to change this or we weren't expecting this? It does all the time. I mean, as you, really? wh what happens in the modeling process, you're going from a block model to then you start to build like a building model and as you refine it, and what we do is we grow in scale. Mm -hmm. So that by the time you're, just before you're going to construction, you have a pretty good sized model, as big as this table maybe, or close to really? it, that you can actually lift the roof off and kind of put your head into a room. Oh yeah? And see that, it, so you kind of know what you're going to get. And mm -hmm. it helps the contractor understand it too. Yeah. Either that, even that, even when you get into construction and you do that, there's still going to be times when you're actually in framing or mm -hmm. steel's going up, things are happening, where you're, you're making modifications. It's, it's kind of a natural process. Mm -hmm. You don't want to want to make any major ones. No, but, yeah, yeah but you don't want to find you, out you can't definitely actually build the house. Find some refinements <laughs> you're going to want to do. And the yeah. clients do too, actually. Mm -hmm. And yeah. do you find um, a lot of your work is Southern California based? Yeah. Do you ever find you guys are revolving around a specific type of building or, or in, in Southern California specifically? Uh, we we I mean, we've done a lot of residences just because I think of the nature of where it's at kind of thing. Yeah. But um, no, I mean, it, it, other than in Southern California, you're dealing with typical or a typical kind of earthquake and mm -hmm. weather kind of conditions yeah. and stuff like that. That plays a lot into it. I mean, there's great light in Southern California, mm -hmm. and so we try to do a lot with how to get daylight into a building. I mean, I think that's really? a really important thing. Yeah, and so. and how long. Because I know from from a lot of my friends here who are architecture majors, they are always working. And how how long is that design process from um, somebody comes up to you with a project and and it, the finished product? Is that how long is that process? Long longer than most people want to. Uh, ever, <laughs> really? Ever, ever, well, it, it changes again. It depends on mm -hmm. the size of the project and the type of the project. But like a standard kind of house thing, you know, a lot of people come and think that. They're going to come to you, and then they're going to get permit drawings in a month, and then they're mm -hmm. going to start and building. It's just going to appear. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, uh, to design a house, over, and, and again, bigger offices are different, different durations, but it takes us about, I'm going to say, six to eight months to mm -hmm. go through the whole design process yeah. with, a, with an involved client going through the permitting and everything else. Mm -hmm. you, I always say is that you can, write, you can put a house out in a month, Mm -hmm. But it's not a house I'd ever want to live in. Yeah, it's because it's not going to be a good one. It's like making coffee. Yeah, to, to yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta, you need time for things to brew. And so, even though you've designed it and everybody says, "Oh, I love it," a week later, the client's going to come back and say, yeah, "I changed my mind on that." Mm -hmm. and, and so, everybody needs time to see a plan, change the plan, see the model, change the model. Yeah. And you want to make sure there's enough of that time in it to really make sure you get mm -hmm. the good essence of what the house can be. Yeah, and I, I bet coffee is a pretty big motif in those six to eight there months. There it is. And you, you mentioned earlier um, an involved client. How, f for people who might be interested in, in being a client, how involved do they need to be, do you feel, through the process? You want somebody who, I mean, again, we, we make these, i said this a number of times, we make the models and, and things like that because we want everybody to put their hands on it. I want the client to say, I don't like that, and really? rip that wall off. So you, you want them to let you know you, exactly. You need, someone has to get in and get involved enough to that they really feel that their heart's in it. Because I, I like to say, like, when we're done with a project, I don't feel like the office designed it. I feel like our office designed it. The engineer designed it, mm -hmm. and the client designed it, and together mm -hmm. we came up with this project. Yeah. Because we all had input, and it's the architect's job to kind of keep all of that stuff into a kind of vision yeah. that stays in, but it takes everybody's input to make sure mm -hmm. that vision is the right vision. Yeah. And do you ever find that to be to be difficult, trying to Extremely to get Extremely difficult. Really? <laughs> <laughs> How so? Yeah. How well, it's got a little bit of an orchestra kind of thing. Yeah. You're trying to kind of conduct everybody, mm -hmm. and you're trying to take everybody's opinion and everybody's idea. And you're trying to pull it together, and a lot of times, some of these ideas <laughs> will send you off on a little bit of a goose chase. Yeah, and you got to kind of run with that mm -hmm. and, and find a way to kind of steer it back to keep the whole yeah. thing together. So this process, that's interesting because I always thought architecture was such a process that it's just one straight line. Like no, this is what it's, and it's a not lot of all. extraneous offshoots, that, and you're always there's all these things going against, and you're trying to kind of keep it yeah. refined. And do you ever find like in the end, this isn't at all what we planned in the beginning, or you're kind of you, well, you, you you do go off some no, things, not completely. <laughs> yeah, but you're generally you're you're moving in a somewhat of a, 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 a let's say it's a meandering trajectory, but it's going in one direction. So you're kind yeah. of getting close to what you mm -hmm. kind of imagined, but there are surprises definitely. Mm -hmm. And what should a client know, ab like about a project that they want to do before approaching you, or what what should they like expect from the process? Like, what will they be asked? You know, it's I I don't think a client needs to know anything. They need to. I mean, I would tell any client who comes to us, I want to say, first of all, have you seen the work we've done? Mm. Are you interested in that? I mean, have you seen other architects' work? I want, they should become educated enough to understand at least what they think they want 
and then looked at another other, enough other architects to decide that you know who's the best person to work with. I mean, one of the important things that happens when you get a client is that when you get with an architect, you're gonna it's it's a long process, and a house yeah. could be six eight months, another building could be two three years in design, yeah. depending on this thing it is. And so you become very involved, and you become kind of part of the family. Yeah. So you, it needs to be somebody that you're comfortable working with. And so it has to be that dynamic. Exactly. There needs to be um, some kind of creative flow, especially in the studio, which yeah. was something I was going to ask you. How, how much of a family do you guys feel like at the end of the day? You feel like a family because you're there late sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just like in uh, any architecture studio in the, uh, in the school and yeah. things like that. People are working late, and so you ha it, it is kind of a family condition mm -hmm. a little bit. It just evolves that way. Yeah. And yeah. actually, funny you should mention, talking about the architecture school here, um, what advice would you give to any architecture student now that, that's trying to, because I mean, you've been in the business for a while, you've already established yourself. What advice would you give to any aspiring architect? That's a great question. Um, you know what, it's like, I think the first thing to do is that you have to kind of, you have every, everybody I think a lot of people want to design their own buildings and find their own way, mm -hmm. and there's always that little bit of a struggle. And I think that that comes with time. And I think the first thing to do is to, understand, find the architects you think you like and the work that they're doing, mm -hmm. and try to study that work in a way that helps you find ideas that come out of your experiences. The yeah, hardest thing I think to yeah. do as an architect, some people I think it comes easy, but is to find out why you want to make architecture and why what you bring to that that makes your architecture hmm. why you think it's important. And sometimes that's a unique thing and sometimes it's not a unique thing, but you have to kind of go through that process to find that. So it's almost, and have you experienced this where it's drawing on other people's uh, views to, to get your own? Person? Yeah, you have to, I think you have to have, well, you have to put it this way, to pick a car, sure. yeah. you have to look at enough other cars to pick the one That's you want. That's true. You have to right? know what you don't want and what you do want. Right, and so it's not that you're trying to copy anybody or anything, but you're trying to understand where that person generated their ideas and why they have those ideas from their mm -hmm. childhood, from their development. So that you can understand. So, what? How does that respond to? How would I respond to that? Yeah, and I'm sure you can attest to. This isn't an instantaneous process. No, Just like building a house, it, yeah, you need to years. have a bunch of different. Yeah. It, was that the case for you? Did you feel? Yeah, it, it takes years to kind of develop an idea and what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. and, and you're always kind of evolving that. Yeah, I was going. Do you feel like you finished? Yeah. Oh or? no, no, no. Really? I, I don't know if you ever finish. <laughs> but that, that has to be the yeah. beauty of it. I mean, yeah. and with your own art at home, and you're inspired by that as well. Yeah, I mean, to me, the, the two things are kind of, they, they kind of merge and they ebb and they flow together. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing in the painting studio and the sculpture stuff is a lot what I'm doing in the architecture. Yeah, and it, and it, and it sounds like you come up with a new thing with almost every project. Would you say that? You come, you're, trying to, you're trying to respond to the conditions that are unique to that project, and you're trying to bring yeah. those up and, and make those kind of evident. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so every, you, you do try to find your, a unique thing in every project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess that's really the core of an artist is finding uniqueness, wouldn't yeah. you say? You're trying, to, you're trying to make sure that that client gets what really is about them evident in their project. Great, and that's great advi advice to any really aspiring artist in general. And with that, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Thank this is you. a great interview. Pleasure. Uh, for, for myself, Dan Toomey, and for Chris Mercier, this has been See You at USC on Monday nights. Thank you so much, and see us tomorrow on Tuesday. watching Trojan Vision. For more of your favorite shows, check us out at trojanvision.com and like us on Facebook. Here's the story of a TV manager who had a team to help out with this 